This is the Pentax Q, a camera I've wanted for 7 years. Now I have it and it's been worth the wait. In this video I will try to explain why. The Q is a mirrorless camera announced way back in 2011. At the time I was all in on the DSLR video boom, so even though it seemed so perfect, I never felt I had the extra cash for a system I would use pretty much exclusively for stills. Now things have changed, 95% of what I do is stills, I'm crazy about small compact cameras and my second hobby is to try old, forgotten and affordable digital cameras. In other words, the timing is perfect, because these are seriously cheap these days. The original Q was a monster in its time. Having a small camera like this with full manual controls, DSLR-like features and interchangeable lenses was unheard of. And it is still quite unique. The only other camera that really comes close is the Panasonic GM series. And I will give you some reasons to why my GM1 might be my main video camera for YouTube, but not something I use very often for stills. And it's not just the size. The Pentax Q is tiny, like seriously tiny. Yet the camera has almost the same features and layout as a big Pentax DSLR. It's pretty customizable, the menus are straightforward and there really isn't anything missing except for maybe a second command dial. The best part of its exterior is the build. This is a top grade old magnesium body and very solid. This is easily better built and more premium feeling than, well, most cameras. That Pentax went through such an effort on such a small camera is nothing short of amazing. One can, however, speculate whether that led to its high price, which in turn probably played a big role in the system going into the freezer. Because the same day as I'm recording this, Pentax has confirmed that it is not completely discontinued. The Q10, which is the same camera, and the updated Q7, as well as the last model, the QS1 released in 2014, are all plastic. The camera shoots video, but like all my modern vintage digital camera reviews, I won't go over it because it's, uh, let's just say it's there. Full HD 30p only, but the Q7 and QS1 has 24 and 25 as well. Sadly, the in-body stabilization isn't as good for video on the Q as it is on, let's say, a modern Pentax KP. Oh, did I forget to mention that? Yep, it has in-body stabilization that works a treat and lets me handhold a 250mm equivalent down to 1 150th of a second or thereabouts. In early reviews it was said to be very slow and have a 5 second startup. That's not really true, they issued a firmware that made it much quicker. They added focus peaking as well. The autofocus is not lightning fast with today's standards, but more than usable. The front dial lets you set presets and such. I shoot RAW DNG only and therefore set it to select aspect ratio for framing instead. I wished it had more options like the Q7 and QS1 would later have. The screen is not very good in bright light and mine has a screen protector making it even worse. The shutter button takes some time getting used to. Just like my Pentax DSLR, it doesn't have a stop for the half press. You just have to learn it. The grip is sweet. You might think sweet for a small camera. No, just plain old sweet. 
I have big hands and I have never, not once, accidentally pushed a button. Somehow they made it work. Like most cameras it came kitted with a standard zoom, a 5 to 15 f2.8 to 4.5 called the number 2. Pentax have named all the lenses in the system like that and I actually like it. So f2.8 at the wide end, that's pretty decent even by today's standards. You could also get it with the number 1 standard prime 8.5mm f1.9 which gives you an equivalent of roughly 47 mm. Now this is a tiny little lens, very sharp and quite fast. As you have understood by now, the sensor is small and the crop is massive. 5.6 times to be exact. But that's needed to keep the camera small and also the lenses. Any of us that have used mirrorless and DSLRs know that the size quickly becomes a non-factor once you start adding glass unless the sensor is smaller. The Q7 and QS1 has a slightly larger sensor with a crop factor of 4.6. The GM1 has a micro four thirds sensor which is much larger than the Q's and as you can see its lens will be much bigger as well. Now some might say, but there are pancake lenses, and its kit zoom is quite small. It's not as fast as the number 2 zoom, but still. And yeah, there is. But they don't have a shutter in them, which means that the GM1 can only shoot a measly 1 over 500th of a second before resorting to an electronic shutter risking jello on moving subjects. Nor does it have an ND. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that as well. Both of these lenses have built-in neutral density filters and leaf shutters, which means that I can shoot them wide open with a 1 over 2000 of a second flash sync in daylight. Yep, even the cheap old kit zoom can do that. And these aren't the only lenses that have it. In fact, let's look at the entire lineup. Here we have them, stretching from the number 1 prime to the number 8 zoom, plus some interesting choices to use with adapters, which are almost exclusive to this system. 8mm Cine Glass. There are plenty of cameras that can use C-mount lenses like this, commonly used on 16mm film cameras, therefore they are cheap, but not unbelievably cheap. 8mm D-mount lenses on the other hand are because no other camera has such a short flange distance and at the same time a small enough sensor. My tip is to do what I did, buy a camera for five pounds and get the lenses included. My favorites by far are these fast 13mm lenses, especially the ones commonly found on Bolex cameras. Just like its 16mm siblings you have seen me use in the past, it has that excellent build with the cool details, like the way it shows the focus distance. It almost covers the entire sensor without vignetting. Regarding sharpness, it's sharp enough for me. Back to the native glass. The number one prime, like I said, is a given. When buying my Q, I looked until I found a black one with the number one. I thought it would be my only lens since I've always been a prime shooter, but I was a bit wrong on that one. As you will see in my images, it can flare a lot. I have since then bought a metal lens hood for it, which helps a lot. To my surprise, one of my local stores still had it in stock. I also got the number 2 kit zoom included with my camera. I thought I would never use it. Well, I was wrong about that too. I've actually taken a couple of my favorite Q images with it. Lastly included with my camera was the number 3, which is a 3.2mm fisheye with a fixed f5.6 aperture. It does not have an ND or shutter and it's manual focus only. This, on the other hand, doesn't get out of the bag all that much. The number 4 and number 5 are labeled toy lenses. 
One is a 6.3mm wide angle, the other an 18mm telephoto. Both fixed aperture at f7.1 and f8. These are fun, but nothing I use all that much. I bought them pretty much solely for the sake of collecting. They were the only ones missing from a full set, so I thought, what the heck. Now we get to what ended up being my go-to lens. The number 6 Telephoto Zoom. A 15 to 45 mm constant f2.8, giving me a 83 to 249 mm equivalent with a leaf shutter and ND. This lens is on the camera 90% of the time. It makes for such a pleasant shooting experience. I like small stealthy cameras with a wide angle for street shooting. Well, this is the same thing, but at the same time the opposite with a tele perspective. You can stand in the middle of the street and shoot portraits without people seeing a guy with a huge DSLR. That puts them at ease. They might still check you out, but that mostly just results in eye contact and a deeper connection. It can also flare a bit, but there is a cheap hood from JJC. Next we have the number 7 mount shield, which is an 11.5mm body cap lens with a fixed f9 aperture and a fixed focus at roughly 2 meters. It's like a pinhole type thing, and I got to be honest, I have a blast when using this. It's very challenging to try and create with such restricted gear. A lens that does cost much, even to this day, used or new doesn't matter, is the number 8 wide zoom. The last of the lenses released for this system, it's a 3.8 to 5.9 mm f3.7 to 4 wide angle zoom. They can all feel a bit plasticky due to the small size, but not this one. It is also equipped with an ND and leaf shutter. Basically, it lets me capture everything in sight with its 17.5 to 27 mm equivalent focal length. So that's the system. Which lenses you should buy depends on you, but if you, for example, are mainly a prime shooter, Get ready to embrace the zooms on this one, because it just makes sense. The wide angle is probably the best for some from the hip action, but the small sensor makes it possible to do with longer lenses as well. Here I just stretched my arm and pressed the shutter button. At the end of the day the standard prime is just an 8mm lens, so even if it's focused somewhere in the distance, the guy next to me will still be reasonably sharp. With some processing we get a usable image. The shadows can take some beating as well, and as a last resort you can always go black and white. It also recovers highlights pretty well, often when I thought they had blown out, they were salvageable. And when they do blow out, it still looks good with a nice roll up for such a tiny sensor. If we compare images to similar but bigger sensor sizes, like the ones found in the iPhone 7, we see that they all can produce an image. But if you want to zoom in, and of course the time it takes to get the shot, not to mention if you want to adjust the exposure manually. A perfect example is when I'm out skiing. I do have my phone as well, but the chance of me removing my gloves and my ski poles to stand around and fiddle with menus are pretty slim. If I were to rank these lenses, I would put the leaf shutter lenses, including the number 2 kit zoom, in some sort of a pro group. The fisheye, the mount shield and the cine glass in the fun group. And the toy lenses go in the what the heck I'll buy them anyway group. The minimum I would want to keep is probably the number 6 and number 1. That way I have my favorite and the smaller one. If you want a more complete kit, you could save some money and buy the number 1, 6 and 2. That way you have all the pro lenses except the expensive 8. And instead of buying that, you buy a used Q7 or QS1 body for less than the lens, 
because the Q7 and QS1 have a slightly bigger sensor, making the wide end of the number 2 23mm f2.8 compared to 21.3 f3.7 if you would have gotten the 8 on the Q. And that's right, I ended up buying the 2014 released QS1 as well. Let's quickly go over it. It is much faster in both operation and autofocus, has a better screen, bigger sensor, I get more use of the control wheel as I can set it to control the ND filter, and it's actually a bit more comfortable to hold. But I don't get the same reach as I do with the Q and the number 6. With some lenses at some apertures it's a tad sharper, but overall pretty much the same image quality. And it is all plastic, which is noticeable. My first impression when I already had the full metal cue wasn't very good. Even the dials are plastic. But after using it for a few days I started to like it. A lot. Mostly due to the responsiveness and comfortable grip. It only feels cheap next to the Q, so if you don't have any of them and all you find are the QS1, Q7 or Q10, just go for it. Being the original, the Q is of course a bit cooler in my opinion. I have comfortably carried both cameras and all the lenses in a regular winter jacket. Pretty epic. When recording this, eBay are still full of them for very reasonable prices. So let's sum it up. I have been wanting one of these for years because it seemed cool. And it is. It is without a doubt the most fun little camera I have ever used. One reviewer, which probably is already sitting to your right in the YouTube suggestion window, Blanti, said it the best. He said it might not be a serious camera for serious photography work, but it is a camera for people that take photography serious. And most importantly, it's always with me. On my way to work, at home, on fun days, as well as annoying days. It's there on that snowy early morning when some awesome dude comes dancing through the streets of Stockholm just to brighten your day. And after all these years and thousands of camera releases later, despite aging specs and a more or less frozen system, it still has a massive cult following and I'm happy to finally be a part of it. That's it, subscribe if you like and follow me on Instagram for new pictures every day. Until next time, goodbye.